Okay, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're at in the world. This is Mark Arnold, Senior Vice President of Marketing with Zap Surgical. Welcome and thanks to everyone for joining us today for what is our very first webinar in our fall webinar series. Uh, this fall webinar series does include 11 talks over the coming 11 weeks. And if you haven't already, I do encourage everyone to visit, <clears throat> excuse me, the website fall.srs-webinars.com to take a look at the uh, remaining 10 talks that we have in store for you. I think most will agree, we have some of the best and the brightest minds uh, on deck for you. As with all of our webinars, you do have to register. So once again, I encourage everyone to visit the website and get signed up. One item of business before we get started, if you have any typewritten questions you'd like to submit at any point during today's talk, you can do that using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And time permitting, Dr. Lim will address those at the end of his talk. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. John Adler. Dr. Adler is the CEO and co-founder of Zap Surgical. He's also the inventor of the CyberKnife robotic radio surgery system. And he's also Professor Emeritus of Neurosurgery at Stanford University. Dr. Adler, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mark. And um, I'm delighted to be able to kick off uh, this new fall webinar series that uh, Zap is putting together. And uh, can't think of a better first speaker than um, uh, Dr. Michael Lim. Uh, truth be told, Dr. Michael Lim was once my resident and now he's my boss at Stanford. So I'm delighted to see how things come full circle, but uh, he has built a brilliant career in neurosurgery uh, and a neurosurgical career with a strong subspecialty in both radio surgery and immunotherapy. And he has uh, spent much of his professional life in the research arena, working on uh, investigating a range of immunological issues relating to uh, brain, the brain and brain tumors. Um, and uh, without further ado, I uh, like to invite uh, Mike to talk to us about how radio surgery is going to be combined with immunotherapy going forward. Thank you. Great. Can, can, can you hear me, Mark? And I hear it looks just great, Mike. Great. All right, great. John, thank you so much for that kind invitation. John, you were one of the first attendings I ever met as a resident. You profoundly influenced my career as well as many others. Um, Hopefully for the better. <laughs> very positively, yes. So uh, thank you again for this really kind invitation. It's my privilege and honor to be here. Um, so, um, you know, with today, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, immunotherapy and brain tumors. And some of the work we did was actually really fun because we were able to um, start and think kind of out of the box. And I think we've made some significant impacts uh, in the field with, with some of the, these, uh, this work. Um, these are my relevant disclosures. So immunotherapy is now a common thing that uh, people talk about. You know, what's interesting back in the early 2000s, this was not even a concept that, I mean, this was not something that was talked about. This was one of those topics at the end of a, uh, any meeting that immunotherapy was mentioned at. But, you know, with the advent of what we call checkpoint inhibitors, it is probably now, uh, they, they project this in, a, in about a, in two years to be a $50 billion industry. Um, and uh, these drugs have really touched the lives of many people and in, 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 in positively uh, with cures or um, improved the qual uh, survival. And uh, almost daily, you're seeing um, FDA approvals uh, coming out for different types of cancers. And so this immunotherapy um, is mainly focused uh, around a concept called checkpoint inhibition or checkpoint you know, activation. So it turns out that you know, when our T cells, our, our immune cells in our body, go and they float around and they um, contact something called the antigen presenting cells. You may remember that from your uh, immunology days or the tumors. There's something called an MHC complex and this MHC complex is um, basically expressing an antigen. And if the T cell has a receptor that rep, uh, recognizes that cognate antigen, it requires a second signal to either turn the T cells on or turns the T cells off. 
okay? And so this mechanism is kind of a safety stop for us because it prevents things like autoimmunity. Um, and um, when things go awry, oftentimes uh, it's because of these mechanisms that people have um, things such as Crohn's disease, um, you know, uh, um, and uh, tachyosis arteritis, all these other things. So it turns out that um, checkpoint molecules are, uh, they're not just one set of checkpoint molecules, but the immune system is built in multiple checkpoint molecules. And it makes sense because you need to be able to control the immune system both in terms of uh, magnitude, I, I call it the volume, or location, right? You don't want the immune system to go uh, systemic when you have to ha fight off an infection in your, let's say, finger. And so um, there are two particular checkpoint molecules that people focused on initially, um, CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. And um, those are the main uh, drugs on our market today. And um, anti-PD-1 is probably the central checkpoint molecule. Um, you know, everyone from uh, BMS, Merck, Astra, you know, AstraZeneca are all focusing on PD-1 inhibition. So with that, as I mentioned before, lots of excitement. Um, about um, 20 to 30 percent of patients are responding and even getting cures. Um, there was a lot of excitement to look at this in gliomas. So back in uh, around 2011 or so, um, people started looking at PD-1. And uh, Dr. Peter Fecci in 2007 started looking at CTLA-4. And when they looked at this in a preclinical model, i.e. mice, they found that these checkpoint molecules were improving survival. And so, um, you know, uh, Jing Zheng, uh, when she was in my lab, who's now a radiation oncologist up at uh, University of Washington up in Seattle, saw that anti-PD-1 worked in a preclinical glioma model. And uh, interestingly enough, when you combine it with radiation, you saw a synergistic response. And I'll get back to that point in a second. Turns out that when you gave the PD-1, the T cells, uh, especially with radiation, were activated. And so it hinted that uh, this could potentially be a viable option. In addition, uh, PD-1, remember it's a receptor in a ligand, re requires its ligand, PD-L1, which is going to be expressed on the tumors. And so um, this was worked by uh, Dr. Edgen Endum and um, uh, Dr. Heimberger and, and their group at uh, MD Anderson, and they showed that uh, the PDL1 was expressed on gli gliomas. So it made sense to go after PD1 or use PD1 to go after GBM. And so there were case reports that were published across the country. Um, this was a case report of a, a, a child up in Toronto that um, got anti PD1 and had a very impressive response. And there were other case reports that were going. And this prompted a large phase three clinical trial that was sponsored by BMS. And this was in a first time recurrent GBM setting. And unfortunately, the sale came out of our, you know, we lost the wind in our sales, essentially because the trial came back negative for both overall survival and progression-free survival. And so it turns out that, um, you know, a lot of people were kind of pessimistic about this. Um, BMS has a large phase three clinical trial going on for newly diagnosed glioblastoma with PD-1 right now in both the methylated and unmethylated setting. So um, now it, it turns out that GBM was not the only tumor that uh, had negative results. And so we've kind of created this dichotomy of, of tumors that responded both hot and cold. Um, hot tumors such as melanoma, lung cancer, renal cell carcinoma, but prostate cancer, pancreatic, and uh, also are kind of falling in that same category as GBM. So what is our path forward in trying to, um, you know, maybe refashion or rethink the strategies for immunotherapy? And so um, obviously it's the one further understanding of the immune microenvironment. Uh, second is to look at other immune cells. Um, and then a third approach is to probably think about combination approaches. And finally kind of uh, reassess the way we take care of patients. And I'll kind of go over these points. So do we understand the immune microenvironment of GBMs? So it turns out that um, as I mentioned before, there are other checkpoint molecules uh, that modulate the immune system. So maybe PD-1 is not the central uh, mediator. And so uh, we've looked in our laboratory, you know, we've, this is where we've gone back to the clinic and um, looked at other checkpoint molecules. So as an example, we looked at a molecule called LAG3 and TIGIT and saw that when we combined them with uh, PD-1, we saw improved survival. 
And so um, as a result, we've been able to launch uh, some cl clinical trials looking at um, some of these checkpoint molecules. Uh, we published our results uh, in, in um, ASCO, and it turns out that with LAG3 and PD-1, we actually got some responders, and um, I apologize, that slide uh, kind of um, disappeared off this talk, but um, we actually had some responders. So it suggests that maybe we need to be a little bit um, more thoughtful in, in, and rational in our uh, approach for immunotherapy. The other opportunity, uh, which is why I think we're all here today, is uh, rethinking our standard of care, right? So for glioblastoma, what do we do for our patients? When a patient comes into the, um, is admitted to our, the hospital, what do we do? We put them on 4Q6, 6Q6 of dexamethasone. We do the surgery, and then we put them on, uh, give them radiation and temozolomide, all of which are incredibly immunosuppressive, right? I tell people, it's like giving a diabetic, um, you know, uh, insulin, but giving them, um, you know, 12 cans of soda before and asking why the, the uh, sugar levels don't go down in people. It may be that we need to rethink uh, the way we're um, giving our standard of care because we may be basically handicapping the immune system. So if we look at radiation as itself, right, we are currently giving hyperfractionated radiation to patients with glioblastoma up to 60 gray. And uh, Skip Grossman at Hopkins back in 2012 published this uh, important paper showing that um, you can actually get developed lymphopenia or drop in T cell counts uh, after you give um, hyperfractionated radiation. And when you get this lymphopenia, this lymphopenia is actually prognostic. You can actually see that when patients have lymphopenia here in this red line, the survival goes down. And so, um, you know, some people said, well, that's confounded by the fact that people patients are given temozolomide. So what he did was then he looked at patients with pancreatic cancer. And um, uh, they published a small, they published a study where they basically gave some people uh, SBRT, with five fractions or less, or they gave conventional radiation, you know, with the regular six weeks of radiation. And turns out that if you give conventional radiation to patients with pancreatic cancer who are not getting concomitant uh, chemotherapy, about 70 plus percent of those patients were developing lymphopenia. But when you gave um, the uh, SBRT, uh, only about 15% of those patients developed lymphopenia. And it was um, prolonged, right? One month and two months out, you saw the same effect. So what's interesting is this lymphopenia doesn't recover very quickly. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I think Benefit, you know, we have as advantageous clinicians is that we get to be in the clinics and see disease. And so, you know, back in 2010 and 2011, uh, radio surgery is part of my practice. Um, I noticed that in some patients, when we gave uh, stereotactic radio surgery, we saw this very brisk T2 response. And I think we've all seen this in patients, right? And this obviously is edema. So we thought to ourselves that perhaps this is an opportunity to you know, take advantage of that and think about uh, maybe using it in combination with immunotherapy. So it turns out that stereotactic radiation is very good at initiating inflammation. It not only does it include, uh, induce cell death, but it can actually cause upregulation of MHC molecules, which I mentioned earlier. You can get spillage of tumor antigens into that uh, milieu of the tumor. You can actually um, turn on some adhesions and co-stimulatory molecules like the PDL1 and or PD1, and then you can actually um, uh, cause cytokines to be released. Um, in addition, as a result, these T cells can be recruited. So Jing Zhang kind of had this thought that perhaps if we take a glioblastoma and treat it with focused radiation, so we're basically taking the idea of using radiation as a definitive therapy and using it as uh, an initiator or kindling. And you give this with um, anti-PD-1, for example, to kind of turn on the T cells, maybe you could get a, a, a you could turn on a brisk an, um, anti-tumor response. And so um, the SARP machine, which was developed by John Long and, and several uh, uh, people at, at Hopkins, is a small animal research radiator platform. Basically, these collimators can go down to two millimeters and you, you have the ability to develop, um, deliver very focused radiation to mice with tumors. And it's uh, image guided with a CT. 
And so the concept was to give these mice tumors and give um, focused radiation and um, uh, immunotherapy concomitantly. And this is where that second survival curve uh, that I mentioned earlier came out, right? So um, when you gave focused radiation plus immunotherapy, you observed this improvement in survival that was synergistic. And, and what was interesting was not only did it turn on the T cells, but it essentially vaccinated the mice against the tumors. If you re-implanted the tumors, and we re-implant, uh, Jing re-implanted these tumors in the flank, okay, not in the brains again, just to show that this immunity is systemic, 100% of the mice remained cured, okay? And what was interesting was not only did you cause the uh, relevant immune cells to come into the tumors, uh, and were, not only were they activated, but you also actually decrease the number of immunosuppressive T cells. They're called T regs. These are T cells that actually function to turn off an immune response. You actually decrease those numbers uh, when you gave this in combination. So um, we thought we started exploring this with other checkpoint molecules. And so CTLA4 plus CD137 um, plus radiation was another idea that we did. And uh, this was Susan Belke's work. And, Again, she showed the combination worked, but the, the triple therapy with radiation uh, worked really well. And what was interesting about this is, and I don't have this figure in here, but she, there was another set of experiments where uh, um, Zineb did where it was again clinically driven. It was a clinically driven question. She asked the question, it, do you need to give the checkpoint inhibitors concomitantly, i.e. the same day, or do you have a little window that you can give it, right? If we translate this to a clinical trial, Sometimes it's very difficult to give patients stereotactic rate of surgery and the infusion of their drugs on the same day, as we all recognize. So what she did was she gave the drugs um, a half, you know, a week before, I mean, um, a few days before, which was a half-life before, the same day, and a half-life after. And uh, it turned out that the um, survival benefit was not lost um, when you gave um, these drugs um, at the same time before or after. And there, that has implications to how we've designed our clinical trials. We've let patients get the, these um, checkpoint molecules a week before the radiation. And I'll talk about it when we talk about some of the trials. Um, again, uh, this is another um, uh, example. Um, uh, Dr. Patel, who's a radiation oncology resident at Memorial Sloan Kettering, looked at anti-gitter, which affects T cells, and again, showed that this radiation was uh, improving it. TIM3 is a, a, a molecule that we've been also very interested in. TIM3 is a molecule that's actually used by um, uh, viruses. It turns out that viruses also can shut off an immune response or cause exhaustion. And so they upregulate TIM3, but it also turns out to be upregulated in glioblastoma. So Jennifer Kim looked at TIM3 and PD-1 in, in uh, GBMs and found that the target existed in human samples of GBM. And what was interesting in mice is that the TIM3 and PD-1 expression increased over time. And so what she did was she gave TIM3 and PD-1 and showed that it works very nicely in combination. But when you gave it um, all three together, you actually got 100% um, survival. And these results were quite striking. And as a result, we've actually launched a, um, a clinical trial at Hopkins um, and we will now open at Stanford where we're going to give uh, TIM3, PD-1, and radiation, uh, stereotactic radiation to patients with uh, glioblastoma. And this is sponsored by Novartis. So um, the other thing, the other topic kind of falling upon this idea of kindling was chemotherapy, right? So as we mentioned before, um, temozolomide is incredibly lymphodepleting. And so... Um, uh, if you uh, actually uh, can rethink giving chemotherapy, maybe we don't have to cause a systemic immunosuppression, right? So here's the systemic chemotherapy ca causing uh, all immune cells, I mean, not only tumor cells, but immune cells to die. But, you know, Dr. Brem, who was my chairman when I was at Hopkins, developed these glial wafers, and Demetrius asked this idea of maybe if we give this chemotherapy locally and not systemically, we could potentially keep the immune system intact and improve survival. And so kind of the same mantra of local uh, disruptive therapy plus checkpoints could have caused systemic immune response. And so BCNU is the active agent in gliadel and showed again that when you gave local chemotherapy plus uh, immunotherapy, you got improved survival. And um, uh, we did it again with temozolomide showing again when you gave it locally improved survival. Now what's interesting is 
we dosed this so that animals could also, we could get survival in animals with systemic therapy. So any animal that got systemic BCNU or, or Tamadar, um, they um, were not obviously immunized against their tumor, but you could not, but if you try to give anti-PD-1 um, to these animals, they would actually, um, they could not mount an immune response. So what came from this study was that you actually irreversibly changed the immune system when you gave people systemic chemo. And even though the white blood cell counts recover, they may not be able to generate an immunotherapy response, an immune response. And this is an example of this. So basically we simulated a recurrent setting where these animals, for example, got um, uh, this animal that survived with uh, B systemic BCNU, even though they gave uh, anti-PD-1, these animals couldn't survive. And so this has implications for recurrent GBM settings, right? Um, this is the, the curve for that, I apologize. There's also a very interesting idea of doing what they call neoadjuvant PD-1, where you give uh, PD-1 um, before surgery. And again, it's kind of playing on that idea. And this was uh, Tim Clossie's work that showed improved survival. So, you know, we think that combination approaches, if we think about it, you know, if surgery, stereotactic grade surgery, local chemotherapy can kind of act as a nidus to incite an immune response. But there's still many questions, how many fractions, the sequence, the dose, and which IO agents. And so I think there are a lot of good questions to be asked, and hopefully we can ask these questions with these clinical trials. Um, for the last uh, few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about brain tumors, and they're different than other types of tumors. So what's interesting is here's a case of a, a patient that had a, a melanoma, and uh, you know it was a very uh, straightforward case. This patient got a gross total resection. But back in 2008 and 2009, we knew that the survival of this patient was less than a year. And it turns out that once you develop a brain met in most cancers, the survival drops off dramatically, right? And why is it that when you have a brain tumor or brain met that the survival of, of these patients are poor? So Chris Jackson had a hypothesis when he's now on faculty at Hopkins, when he worked in my lab, said that perhaps um, having a brain tumor or brain metastasis could actually cause um, changes in the immune system. And so what he did was he basically took um, melanoma cells and we have, a T cell, uh, we have an uh, antigen specific model. Basically there are these mice that are bred to have T cells that specifically rep, uh, recognize an antigen called OVA, which is foreign to mice. But this OVA is a chicken antigen. And so what you can do is you can implant these tumors into, the, uh, into mice. And so we, Chris implanted into the brain and into the periphery of, of animals. And then what he did was he adoptively transferred those T cells that specifically recognized these tumor cells and then pulled them out a few days later. And what he found was quite striking. It turns out that if you have a tumor in the brain, um, these, somehow those T cells that recognize the cancer cells are actively deleted. And not only are they deleted, but they lack the ability to divide. This is basically divisions. And they did not express interferon gamma. So basically, those T cells were being deleted and inactivated. It also turns out Dr. Peter Fetchy and his group showed that those brain tumors actually push those T cells out of the, uh, away from the brain and into the periphery. They actually sequester it uh, into the bone marrow. And it turns out that um, there are circulating what they call macrophages that um, sit there and go through the blood of, of patients with GBM, if they encounter any antigen-specific T cells, they'll actually inactivate them. So it, it turns out that having a brain tumor causes global immunosuppression. And this is a major hurdle that we need to uh, account for. You activate, you not only um, inactivate and delete those T cells, but you um, traffic them away. Um, so it's uh, a profound, um, phenomenon. And it turns out that, you know, we then asked the natural question, what's causing this global immunosuppression? And Chris found that um, the, these macrophages or myeloid cells um, look like, or microglia are causing the systemic immunosuppression. He found that there's a, a cytokine called TGF-beta, and he traced it back into the brain uh, to these immune populations. And it turns out that if you block TGF-beta, you can reverse some of this immunosuppression. And so these myeloid cells are something that we also need to take account of when we uh, develop our immunotherapy strategies, even with radiation. It turns out that myeloid cells are macrophages, microglia, and dendritic cells, and they actually um, are the predominant immune cells in GBM. There are actually very few T cells in comparison to this. And so 
you know, a lot of work has been done trying to inhibit this. This is work from Derek Wainwright, where he gave um, a, a drug called IDO, which blocks those macro, micro, uh, myeloid cells, and gave it with PD-1 and, and uh, CTLA-4 inhibitors. Um, Tomas Garza on Movedi looked at CSF1R and FLT3, again, showed that, uh, uh, again, uh, disrupting those myeloid cells important. We then went back into our initial model that I showed you with uh, Zineb, where, um, I mean Jing, where she um, saw the PD-1 and stereotactic radiation improve survival, and it turns out that focused radiation actually changes PD-L1 expression uh, in the microglia. It actually increased uh, the PD-L1 expression in the macrophages, so that's why giving the radiation and then the PD-1 probably um, uh, works synergistically, but a lot of work is being done on this. So, you know, at the end, uh, I think that, you know, the, the results for immunotherapy for glioblastoma are disappointing right now, right? And it's because um, we think that CNS tumors are different. There's different checkpoint molecules, different mechanisms of immunosuppression in different immune populations. And, um, you know, combination approaches uh, are, are one, uh, um, another way to look at this. Local chemotherapy, focused radiation, surgery, even um, people are looking at uh, focused ultrasound now. Um, and I think that there are very interesting questions to ask. In addition, it's clear that we have to further understand the immune system to be able to come up with better rational therapies. Um, and, you know, for example, uh, attacking the myeloid cells may be uh, very important. So with that, I want to acknowledge that there's a lot of work. Uh, I've worked with fantastic medical students and, and collaborators over my years at Hopkins and outside of Hopkins. I also have a great um, uh, clinical team, um, not only our clinical trials division, but my colleagues in radiation oncology, medical oncology, um, and neurosurgery. Um, I also want to acknowledge my relevant funding and, and want to thank you for your time. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. That was uh, brilliant. Um, I, it's maybe hard for everyone in this audience who may be newer to radio surgery than, than I am to just appreciate how much the field has changed in the last 10, 15 years, in large part because of you and just the thinking that there could in fact be biological modifiers to radio surgery that will make such a huge difference. And what impresses me is how this scope of your work just crosses disciplines, you know, going from surgery to, you know, oncology back to radiation and involves, you know, looking at pancreas tumors to lung cancer, melanoma, and now the brain. It's just, it's fantastic. And um, I'm just so excited that you're at Stanford and uh, you're going to be a great boss, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Although uh, it's, it's definitely Hopkins loss. But um, I'd like to, you know, there's a, someone, I ask, invite the audience to ask questions, but I'm going to ask one to start is, um, can you tell the audience a little bit more about this trial involving um, anti-PD-1 and anti-TIM uh, combined with radiosurgery for GBM? Could you yeah. That trial, the nature of enrollment, stuff like that? Yeah. So it's going to be for patients with first time recurring glioblastoma. And um, as we said, these are patients that we think that could be eligible for um, radio surgery. You know, sometimes when you do these clinical trials, you create all these beautiful little um, uh, inclusion and exclusionary criteria, but then you can get uh, in trouble with insurance and all these things. So what we basically said is anybody who we think is eligible to get um, stereotactic radio surgery is eligible for this trial. And then, you know, obviously we want patients who have um, some, uh, um, you know, some sign of uh, health in their immune system because, the, as you saw, some people's immune cells uh, counts drop. So we kind of built a moment into that, and obviously the performance status has to be reasonable. And so, th while the study is kind of more of phase one to show safety, we also built in a lot of correlatives. So we're going to get a lot of blood from uh, and tumor samples to be able to kind of try to understand what's going on. Um. In light of the lymphopenia uh, that you see with conventional radiation uh, therapy, I mean, are at Hopkins and now at Stanford, are all patients with the GBM going to get um, radio surgery, stereotactic radio surgery? Up front, up front. I'm sorry, the. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, the, uh, my uh, internet cut out. What about GBM scanning radio surgery? Um, in light of the clinical, uh, the experimental evidence that uh, mice get this profound lymphopenia with uh, conventional radiation, are all uh, patients at Stanford, for example, or did they at Hopkins, uh, with upfront GBM get radio surgery rather than conventional radiotherapy? Yeah, so uh, right now, um, patients, uh, I mean, that is the standard of care. Hopkins had a small study where they're giving uh, SBRT, I mean, uh, SRS, basically five fractions, and Scott Soltis is running a trial or ran a trial giving five fractions as, to, as an equivalence trial. So we'll see what comes out of that. Yeah, I am aware of this, the, the Stanford trial, and I think that the data was pretty good, but it really, you know, it, it builds the foundation for thinking about how we can be much more aggressive with these tumors immunologically, because if there's no chance to be immunologically aggressive, if you're going to deplete your entire immune system up front, um, the way I look at it. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, somebody here asked, could artificial intelligence prove valuable for optimizing the balance of radiosurgery, immunotherapy, and chemotherapy? Pretty open-ended question. Hey, you're in Silicon Valley now, Michael. You, everything has to involve AI. <clears throat> well, so AI and precision medicine, in my mind, go hand in hand. And so I think it highlights the second part of understanding the immune microenvironment. Um, we actually had a clinical trial. So one of our other clinical trials that we um, uh, were, were running, but unfortunately BMS uh, has changed directions, was actually a biomarker-driven trial. So we had you know, targets A, B, and C. And so we were taking tumors out of um, patients and uh, checking them with the immunohistochemistry for A, B, and C. And if they expressed A, they got you know, immunotherapy drug A. They, if they expressed B, they got immunotherapy drug B and C. So um, you know, as we move to that, obviously it's gonna get more complex than that. And artificial intelligence absolutely, I think will play an important role. Um, you know, there's tutor, tumor heterogeneity. All the stuff is going to be measured and quantified, and this is going to be beyond the, the ability of us with our brains to be able to, to do this. And so, yeah, I agree. I think this is going to be personalized, not just for immunotherapy, but for targeted therapies and other things. Um, another member of the audience uh, asked um, how to account for the uh, non-MRI evident gliomatosis on GBM at the time of prescribing the radiation field. He feels that that is, from his way of looking at tumors, the biggest challenge. Well, I, so, I mean, I guess from a conventional radiation, that's a different question. Um, I mean, obviously they gotta radiate a lot bigger fields, but you know, the point of this- Well, it doesn't work. I mean, I'll all challenge, okay, you're, tr you're radiating, but are you doing anything? And so right. I think that's the bigger challenge to the field. I mean, it's just, the assumption has always been and this work goes back to even the time I was at Mass General and Amy Pruitt and Fred Hochberg, they did, they did, that's really a date. It's a 35 year old construct where you had this gliomatosis. And then the assumption was, well, if we treat it with radiation, it's gonna make a difference. But uh, I, I shouldn't be talking over my speaker here. So <laughs> I'm sorry, Michael, please no. go ahead. No, I think that's a great, great input. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, what I'm trying to, what we're saying with this radiation and this approach is that immunotherapy is the definitive hammer, right? Or, you know, but the radiation may be the kindling to start the fire. So if you have gliomatosis, you may not need to radiate. I mean, you still want to probably do some focused radiation enough to get the immune system started and then start the fire. That's the hope with not just gliomatosis, but widely metastatic people. And, um, you know, the nice thing is, I'm going to switch the, the topic a little bit. You know, I don't know if you saw in the last ASCO, but it was a big trial and they showed a 17% improvement in efficacy for patients who received stereotactic rate of surgery and immunotherapy. That's a huge deal. Um, that means that you're probably igniting some sort of systemic response. 17% is isn't a hundred percent, but there's actually some data now that you can do that. So maybe with gliomatosis, maybe with um, stereotactic rate of surgery and you know, maybe uh, the immunotherapy, you know, version five from now, maybe that'll work. But that's the hope with this work that we can address something like gliomatosis or in the future. Um, question, uh, simple question. 
How do you do radio surgery in mice? So that's that. It's pretty neat. The SARP machine that I showed earlier, um, um, it basically, it's this little platform that holds the head and they actually, you can get a CT scan on the mice before, and then uh, you can actually um, deliver uh, radiation stereotactically. If you look up the SARP device, it's called, it's made by Extra, X-S-T-A-H-R-L, I believe, or, but just look up SARP, S-A-R-R-P, for the audience members uh, in Google, mm -hmm. and you'll find that it's commercially available now. Uh, that company's been making that device, and you can see exactly how it works, and, it, and it's a very nice machine. I mean, you commented earlier about precision medicine, and yeah. you know Stanford likes to sell itself as the Precision Medicine Institute of the future. Um, perhaps with you, it'll happen. So you see a huge heterogeneous response to different sorts of therapies, and given the number of patients that have been treated to date with um, immunomodulation and radiosurgery, have there been some antidotes that sort of suggest that this stuff really does work in a few select patients? Uh, precision medicine? Well, now, yeah, it is, well, it is a, a window into precision medicine. Have you seen, have there been some antidotes, anecdotal responses to immunotherapy and combined with radiosurgery that are quite striking? And that might be a window into what the future might hold if we ha could select patients more carefully. Well, it is in precision medicine, but um, the ASCO poster that was, I mean, the ASCO uh, presentation from last year, not this past year, but a year from, so um, 2018, um, I mean, 2019, they did show a 17% improvement in uh, efficacy in terms of survival for patients with metastatic melanoma receiving um, focused radiation and checkpoints. So I think that people- I was really I want to refer back to the GBM work. Yeah. With GBM. With GBM, the, I mean, we're just starting these trials now, and there's been no case reports that I am aware of. of giving well, you, showed, you showed a single case report on Toronto of a child. That's just them receiving anti-PD-1 alone. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So um, the only biomarker that they think will predict it right now is something called um, tumor mutational burden. It basically, if they have lots and lots of mutations, yes. um, then these tumors are responding and, and um, uh, they think that glioblastomas that have this high mutational burden will be responders. Not ones induced by temozolomide, but kind of just um, by the tumor itself uh, at, in the very beginning. And there's a clinical trial that's running right now, uh, sponsored by the Alliance, and we'll have that answer hopefully in a year or two. The problem is only 1% of GBMs have this um, high tumor mutational burden. So, but that'll be an example of a biomarker and uh, precision medicine. Gotcha. Okay, well look, Mike, this was a, a brilliant talk and I can't tell you how excited I am to have you at Stanford. And I'm sure if anyone is gonna be creating the immune therapy, radiosurgery combinations of the future, it'll be you. And you're really driving the field and I salute you in every way possible. And I really point out to the audience that I think that we are entering an era where immuno, not just immuno, but I think biological modification of radiosurgery in general is going to be the next big wave of our field. And it's gonna definitely take individuals like Michael Lim to sort of make it happen. So urge others to, step up and maybe help as well. Okay, everybody. Um, thank you, right. Michael. And thank you to everyone for joining us this morning and this evening, wherever you are in the world. Everyone have a great day and stay safe. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Thank you very much.